Hi, everyone. Thank you um, to Dr. Brown's Medical. Thank you, Lisa, for that really kind introduction. Um, like she said, I'm Kelly Andrasic McLeod, and I am so excited to be here today. I have been an OT for almost 15 years, but within the last couple years, I completed my doctoral work for my occupational therapy doctorate at Kansas University Medical Center. And what I focused on was improving breastfeeding outcomes for infants within the neonatal intensive care unit. So that's one of my big areas of passion. My other area of passion is teaching, which is why I'm so excited to be here to share this webinar with you today. Um, I also turned my doctoral work into a continuing education course through the Lactation OT. It's completely asynchronous and available for continuing education units. So the information that we're gonna talk about today is completely new and updated as we will be discussing the most current literature within the majority of the studies we discussed today will have been completed within the last three years. So before we get started, I do have disclosures. Um, I am a salaried employee at a large Bay Area teaching hospital and the views expressed today are completely my own. I'm on the Clinical Advisory Board for Lansino Laboratories, and um, I'm also giving this webinar through Dr. Brown's Medical for today. I have no non-financial disclosures to share. So for our objectives, by the end of today's lecture, um, attendees will be able to list three treatment strategies to improve breastfeeding success with infants with medical comorbidities, this includes our hospitalized infants, such as those within the neonatal intensive care unit, maybe the pediatric intensive care unit, as well as infants in early intervention, um, NICU follow-up clinic, and even regular outpatient. Participants will be able to explain two interventions to maximize breastfeeding potential for infants born prematurely, and the last section of our talk will be about tongue tie. So we will um, be sure that you can describe two ways that tongue ties can impact breastfeeding outcomes. So there are some presentations where you really struggle with what to say, and maybe you don't even have enough to fill the time, um, but this presentation is the opposite of that. Um, I, there's so many things that I wanted to say, and the harder thing was to actually cut things down to fit into the time frame of today's presentation. So when I first had the idea for today's talk and was invited to share um, about breastfeeding for Breastfeeding Awareness Month, what I really struggled with was how to provide meaningful information that applied to a variety of healthcare providers with a variety of experience. I know some of you may have a lot of experience with breastfeeding and some of you may be just starting out. Um, there's lots of courses out there. Um, so what, what could I possibly say in just an hour that would make a difference and give everyone in the audience just a little bit uh, more wisdom moving forward? So that's when I came up with how this talk would be different. Today's talk is really focused on the very latest research that supports long-term breastfeeding outcomes, much of which can be environmental setup. Um, psychosocial supports, emotional supports. So today's talk is not going to be an overview of breastfeeding basics or even anecdotal information. Because of this, it may feel like today's talk jumps around a little bit, but I want you to know that's completely by design. Today's talk is the literature review you've always wanted to do, but perhaps didn't have time to do. So with that being said, here are the rules for today's talk. All references will be no more than five years old, but as you check the reference list, you'll see that most are even less than three years old. And I held myself accountable to this. I quadruple checked the reference list and made sure that again, um, when possible, less than three years old, definitely no more than five years old. The other thing I wanted to make sure is that at the end of the talk, you'll actually have some concrete ideas of how to integrate these new strategies into your practice. And part of that onus comes on to you. So as we go through the lecture today, jot some ideas down of concrete things that you can do to integrate and update your practice to support breastfeeding. And then create a plan to share with your team. Um, finally, flag studies to read, you know, a one to two minute introduction or overview that you'll get today does not replace reading and knowing the literature yourself. 
And then the final rule for today's talk is don't hate the messenger. The reason I say that is because I couldn't include every study within the last three to five years. And some studies, to be honest, may highlight something that feels discouraging. Again, this is just a taste of the information that is out there and a lack of research on something you feel strongly is valid doesn't necessarily mean it's not true, but perhaps it just needs to be explored and further researched. So as practicing clinicians, you all know this, it can be incredibly overwhelming when reading research studies. So I found this paper that really talks about how to appraise the evidence and then what to do about it. So the first three steps are covered in today's presentation. So step one is really clarifying what you're trying to do. And that starts by asking a clinical question, considering the population, issue of interest, comparison related to the, out, to the intervention, and then the outcome. So for today, that's helping our medically complex infants with breastfeeding, looking at how we can support that, and then figuring out what uh, the outcome is when we have that support in place. The second step is conducting a systematic search to discover what is known. And I've done that work for you today, and you'll be getting an overview of the results in the talk. And then three is complete a critical appraisal of the research. So to critically appraise the research, it's really important to keep in mind that not all research studies are created equal. So as you look over this pyramid, starting at the bottom with level five, the strength of the research study improves as you work your way up the pyramid with level one showing the strongest evidence. This doesn't mean that studies at the other levels are not meaningful. And in fact, most research starts at level five or level four. With exploration and more studies into a similar topic, it becomes stronger. So you can think of level five as really the starting point. And it's sometimes the work we're doing and living day to day with our clients. Level five can be a single case study on just one patient. So with that, we may not be able to replicate the findings um, to other patients, it just may not translate. But if more cases are noted and published, we're already up to level four, which is a case series. Level three is case controlled studies, level two is cohort studies, and level one includes our systematic reviews where multiple studies are appraised and findings are synthesized. Level one also includes our randomized control trials, which is really the gold standard for research. So with that being said, let's jump right into our first study. So this was an ethnographic study over six months, and I find it very interesting because it highlights some of the universal struggles with supporting breastfeeding in the NICU. Information was gathered over two different neonatal intensive care units with 135 hours of observations and interviews with nurses and physicians. What they found was that there was widespread agreement that breastfeeding is important, but the implementation of breastfeeding policies was problematic. And so over the course of the study, three major themes emerged. The first one is contradiction. And what that means is what staff believed versus what they actually did to support breastfeeding had a disconnect. And breastfeeding sometimes was seen as, and this is in quotes, a nicety and not a necessity. The second theme was working conditions. So staff shortages, um, time restrictions, busy schedules, lack of pumping facilities, space restrictions, lack of continuing education on breastfeeding had a negative impact on staff implementing um, breastfeeding policies and supporting breastfeeding. And the final theme was of controlling relationships. And so what the researchers said was that nurses had perceived ownership of the environment and the baby. And they had a direct quote that I wanna share from you. So it says, um, it was from a nurse. Um, we don't allow the nurses to breastfeed until we become 100% sure that the child is feeding well and doesn't get tired during breastfeeding. I mean, it's not like we don't give the baby to his mother out of abuse, end quote. 
While these words are strong, I think we can all relate to the sentiment and that is wanting to um, keep the environment as safe and controlled as possible so that um, the baby can be really successful. And I think that breastfeeding introduces a little bit of a gray um, as far as how the baby is doing with feeding. We can't measure it exactly. We can't control it the way we can control the nipple or um, the way the baby is bottle fed. And so I think that that's what the sentiment um, is really trying to get at. To read a quote about the themes that arose, together, these elements revealed a situation whereby the staff appeared more preoccupied with addressing the task of caring for the babies than with supporting mothers in feeding and subsequently caring for their preterm children. We all feel this push and pull between the numerous responsibilities that we have to the baby and to their family. So knowing how breastfeeding, um, how important breastfeeding is, and knowing that there are barriers to the logistics of supporting it in practice, what can we do? So the first thing the researchers mentioned is we must acknowledge that NICU healthcare professionals, especially nurses, play a huge role in breastfeeding success. And for this reason, it's so important that ongoing CEUs for breastfeeding education are imperative. Supportive policies, themselves may not be enough. And for this reason, implementation should be evaluated. That can be quality improvement studies, identification of site-specific barriers, and then the healthcare professionals actually working in the environment must be the ones to advocate for solutions. So you know the environment where you work the best, which makes you the best person to advocate for solutions. Additional recommendations from this studies. Um, certified lactation consultant should be available for each unit. And NICUs and hospitals should have specific protocols to support um, breast pumping, proper milk collection and storage, initiation of feeding for the infant, and management of common breastfeeding problems. So thinking about specific takeaways from this study, what protocols and resources does your unit have? What is your unit lacking? What are the barriers to seeing these specific um, protocols uh, be carried through? So our next study used a mixed method approach to look at breastfeeding support within the NICU. And information was gathered from 29 level three Canadian NICUs. They evaluated a huge range of support, including um, the layout of the unit to see if it was breastfeeding friendly or not, available breastfeeding support personnel, education supports for mothers who breastfeed, breast pump related resources, coordination of post-discharge breastfeeding support, and also breastfeeding related policies. So these were the questions that were asked of the participating NICUs. Um, again, it looked at staffing um, about who is available to support breastfeeding directly or counsel families, what breastfeeding resources um, the units had to educate mothers, um, how the NICU supports mothers who are expressing milk, what policies are in place with either breastfeeding or breastfeeding related topics or skin to skin, which we know supports breastfeeding outcomes. And we'll talk a little bit more about later in this talk. What is the role of breastfeeding um, in discharge planning? Are there available referrals for community resources that follow up? And then um, the study also had an open-ended question. Um, are there any other breastfeeding related supports that you would like to add that we haven't yet discussed? So I love this study because these questions are something super concrete and very easily accessible for you to use to do a little QI project on breastfeeding supports within your NICU. So the study categorized their findings and I haven't included all of them in the talk. There's so many more, but I just put a couple up here for us to reference and talk about. 
So when it comes to breastfeeding education for mothers, 100% of the units had printed handouts. 59% had electronic resources, which I think identifies an area that could be improved upon. Um, I wonder how many families take the folder that we've given them with all the papers in it from their hospital stay and maybe don't look at it again for a while until they shred those papers, but how often are families on their phone? So if we had electronic resources, something readily accessible, that might be a little bit easier. Um, group education ses sessions were used with about 39% of the NICUs and posters displayed within the unit were only 14% of the time. Um, I think adding education in a really visible place for staff and families to reference is kind of low hanging fruit in terms of increasing awareness and support for breastfeeding. When it came to breast pump related resources, um, the NICUs all had breast pumps available to use in the unit as well as fridge and freezer space and provisions of breast pumps, but there really was a deficit in terms of a breast pump loan programs. So again, really easy to scan this list and compare it to your unit to see what areas could be strengthened upon. When it came to breastfeeding related policies, here are the different policies that this study screened for and the percentage of the time that NICUs have them available. So things like skin to skin, most units had a policy to support this. Breastfeeding in general, about 60% management of express milk about 60% and then it goes down in percentage as we go through the list here. So again, um, easy quick takeaway from this talk is using um, the list of resources here to do a little screening of what your unit has, what is missing and what um, could be uh, added to strengthen your support for breastfeeding moms. So knowing that milk production is determined by actions focused on the first hours and days after birth, this NICU in Spain in 2021 um, is when it was published, decided to explore strategies to increase mother's support for immediately pumping and establishing a milk supply. So prior to the study in this NICU, um, most mothers privately purchased a pump, which meant they didn't have a pump within that first 24 hours. So this pilot project was incredibly simple. Um, it was a small observational study. And what they did was increased breast pumps at bedside. So that meant moms got pumps closer in proximity to their baby. They had access to it immediately. And with that, they also improved their educational strategies and updated information for parents. And what they found with this just very small change and simple intervention was the volume of mother's milk at day 14 doubled and ultimately increased to greater than 500 mLs a day. Even more impressive, the rate of exclusive breastfeeding at discharge went from 26% to 76%, which is just absolutely incredible. And then finally, they found the cost of donor milk decreased by 15.7%. So I love this study because it tells you the power of an incredibly simple intervention that demonstrated significant change. I also really love this study because they included decreasing costs as a marker of success, because we all know that is something that gets um, hospital administration to pay attention to. So simple takeaway from the study, Breast pumps available bedside can significantly improve breastfeeding outcomes. So think about your unit. Is this available? Um, if not, what can you do to help make this happen? Sharing the information from this study, I think could be a really, really powerful tool to starting that process. So if you are in this talk, you're probably already hopefully very well-versed in the benefits of skin to skin, but skin to skin is still being studied. And so this study was published in 2021. Um, it came out of China and it was a longitudinal um, randomized control trial of 79 preterm infants. They had two groups. So a kangaroo mother care that got 2.5 hours of kangaroo care a day, which is really not that much. It's like what, 12% of the day, I think, versus the control group. And then measurements were taken at 40 weeks post-menstrual age, so right at the baby's due date, 
three months corrected age, and then also six months corrected age. And they looked at markers such as the baby's physical growth, the neonatal behavioral neurological assessment, and also breastfeeding outcomes. So the kangaroo mother care group by discharge had a higher percentage that received mother's milk, a higher percentage that were exclusively breastfed and significantly increased body weight and length. So that was even just by discharge. The KMC group long-term outcomes showed something similar and that was increases in body weight, length and head circumference, higher neurobehavioral scores and then a higher percentage exclusively breastfed at six months corrected age. And again, I just wanna highlight that the KMC group in the study did 2.5 hours of skin to skin per day, which is really not a huge time commitment or um, a huge thing to take on. So the immediate benefits of KMC are often well known and discussed, but as you can see from the study, there are very specific implications to improve breastfeeding outcomes as well. So the takeaway from this study would be promoting early and often KMC to support improvements in breastfeeding is one of the additional benefits of KMC. And additionally, providing education to other staff and also to families about how KMC can support breastfeeding can also help to reinforce why it is so important and help to get the ball rolling early on. So this study was an examination of direct breastfeeding and the relationship to long-term breastfeeding rates. So from a convenient sample, a retrospective chart review of 88 infants was completed. All the infants were born at less than 34 weeks gestation and were housed in the level four neonatal intensive care unit. Of the infants who received human milk, 59% had the first feeding at the breast and 33% of the mothers had specific breastfeeding goals. So one of the primary metrics for this study was the number of direct breastfeedings per day. So the researchers figured this number out by dividing the number of direct breastfeedings by all of the oral feeding opportunities in the hospital. So this was an average throughout. So what they found was that mothers who did on average at least one direct breastfeeding per day were more likely to have breastfeeding goals, increased maternal age, the infants had more days between the first breastfeed and introduction of the bottle and shorter lengths of stay. So one of the recommendations here um, that the researchers had was that mothers should be supported to breastfeed before bottle feed. So this is something I think that could be easily looked at to integrate into your unit. So whatever your feeding protocol is, is there a way to ensure that mothers who are interested and able to breastfeed have that opportunity before the bottle is introduced? Could there be a period of 24, 48 uh, hours, uh, one week of protected breastfeeding? Can we work to get these babies to the breast? Um, maybe not for nutrition, but maybe after mom pumps, um, before putting the baby to breast, before they start bottle feeding. So something really important to think about whether you use infant-driven feeding or some other feeding protocol in your unit, how can we get babies to the breast first? The other recommendation that came from this um, was the importance of goal setting. And goal setting really plays an important role in empowering mothers to breastfeed and advocate for their babies. So what are some additional findings from this study? Mothers need support for daily presence in the NICU. Um, it goes without saying, if you are present in the unit more often, you will be able to be more likely to breastfeed, right? So what barriers can we take away so that the mom has what she needs to be able to be in the unit to be available to practice breastfeeding? The study also showed um, that waiting to work on breastfeeding until after discharge is not research supported. And every time I hear this, it makes me so um, just like my heart hurt a little bit when a mom tells me, well, let's just work on getting the bottle of feeding now. I want to get my baby home. And then once they're home, we'll figure out breastfeeding. Again, that is not supported in the research in terms of long-term breastfeeding success. 
The study also showed that first mothers need even more support, first time mothers. And finally, that breastfeeding experience within the NICU has implications for months. So there are a couple studies on fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing that I included today. And so for those of you who are not familiar with um, fees for short, it is a collaborative bedside um, swallowing evaluation where a trained clinician, um, either ENT or SLP, depending on your unit, positions a laryngoscope. And this provides a superior view of the um, internal structures and anatomy. And you can see a picture there on the right. Um, so with this test, we get a view of the epiglottis, the vocal cords, the larynx, the benefits of this type of a study when comparing it to um, our other instrumental evaluations of swallowing, um, such as the video fluoroscopic swallow study. Um, you don't need any radiation for a fees, and there's no ingestion of barium. And so for these reasons, it can be used to assess breastfeeding. So as in the previous slide, I mentioned that fees can be used to evaluate breastfeeding, but this study actually examined the safety and feasibility with a pilot study looking at a unique population. And this was NICU infants with swallowing dysfunction. You can see a picture there on your slide of the clinicians from the study actually doing a fees within their unit. So this study was a convenient sample of 25 infants who completed bottle feeding um, with a video fluoroscopic swallow study and then bottle feeding with a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing and then had the option to do a fees B, which is a fees at the breast. They utilized a team of SLPs, OTs, and ENT. Um, and this study is actually a really great reference for detailed procedures of how this multidisciplinary team utilizes fees and what their step-by-step -step process was. So of the 25 total patients in the study, 10 were breastfed, five agreed to participate in um, a fees at the breast. In regards to safety, no adverse events were noted. So there was no nosebleeds, no laryngospasm, no autonomic instability, but they did note that the difference in respiratory rate did approach significance. So something that we would need to watch carefully. From a feasibility perspective, two of the five infants latched and breastfed. One had a swallow with penetration, um, neither had aspiration. So that means that three of the babies um, did not, uh, were not able to have breastfeeding assessed. So of those three, two latched, but did not extract milk and one was not able um, to latch. So the takeaways from the study, um, again, if you do fees at your unit or are interested in doing fees, I think that this is a study worth flagging to read about the methodology and how they use a highly skilled multidisciplinary team for an amazing team approach for fees. But the other thing I think the study really highlights is the need to really carefully consider how our patients may or may not be able to participate, as well as think um, proactively about supportive strategies to promote neurobehavioral organization to increase per, um, successful participation in fees. So I'm gonna highlight just one other study about breastfeeding and fees. Um, this was specifically for infants with laryngomalacia. So as you know, breastfeeding can be particularly challenging for infants with airway compromise. So this retrospective cohort study used endoscopic evaluation of 23 infants with laryngomalacia. And so during the fees, observations were made of clinical signs of airway compromise, including um, looking at the anatomy and the swallowing dynamics during breastfeeding. Things the researchers assessed include position of the base of the tongue, the laryngeal outlet, vocal cords, timing of milk flow and penetration, um, as well as aspiration. If airway or swallowing compromise was present, the initial, infant's initial position at the breast was altered from either supine or sideline to be semi-prone. And then they went on to describe the clinical and endoscopic um, changes that they observed in the new position. And so what they found was that 
signs of airway obstruction or compromised airway protection were present in 87% of the infants in supine or semilateral position. Once these babies were repositioned semi-prone, they saw either an improvement or resolution of strider, improved ability to latch, and improved dynamic airway function and reduced aspiration risk. So I found the methodology really interesting um, and I think a really good reference, again, if you're looking for a study to flag to read later. And they had some really great pictures that I've shared with you today. So this is a picture of a rubber band and tape, which allowed the mother more freedom to move while securing the endoscope in place. And I just love that um, idea they had. Additionally, the study had some um, really great examples of semi-prone position that you can see here on the slide. So the study is a really great reference for some ideas regarding procedure related to fees, as well as positioning implication for medically fragile infants, particularly those with laryngomalacia. Um, but there may be some other babies who benefit from these position changes and supports as well. Now we're getting to a highly technical study. Um, and this was um, one of the only ones I found that was actually on video fluoroscopic swallow study at the breast. So as you know, to do a VFSS, we actually need the baby to drink some barium. So um, generally a VFSS is not going to be the best study for this because there's not a way to have barium come out of mom but they actually used an aspiration catheter with a 20 ml syringe of barium. So used basically like an S and S so that they could start to look at the swallowing function at the breast. So this was a retrospective study of 25 VFSS with a variety of diagnoses such as laryngomalacia, prematurity, esophageal atresia. And the goal was to analyze similarities and differences between the breast and the bottle. So the researchers looked at swallowing function, oral structures and function, tongue and mandible movements. And again, for breastfeeding, all the infants laid in left side lying with um, the aspiration catheter and the syringe to give them barium. So there were significant differences. So um, I just highlighted a few of them here for you. Um, and one of the things I found to be the most uh, uh, significant was the nasal pharyngeal reflux. So 56% of babies when bottle feeding were observed to have this, and that number dropped pretty dramatically to just 4% at breastfeeding. And that indicates a very significant difference with the way the velum functions with breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. In regards to penetration, penetration was observed 25% of the time with bottle feeding, but only 4% of the time with breastfeeding. Aspiration was observed the same across breastfeeding and bottle feeding during this study, and that was 8% on both trials. So I found this study particularly interesting to read, and it confirms some things we already know. There are physiologic differences between the breast and the bottle. There are just really limited studies that can evaluate and measure it to this degree that this study did. And so that's why our clinical evaluation and judgment can really come into play. Additionally, something else to consider, as these patients were fed with a catheter and syringe at the breast, the study could not perfectly replicate mother's flow um, and also like variation in the flow rate um, with letdown from the breast. So another incredibly technical study that made my head spin a little bit when I read it um, was about the evaluation of breastfeeding um, under uh, MRI. And I found this one absolutely fascinating. So this was a pilot study of 12 infants, all less than five months old. They took static images of 11 infants and dynamic images of nine and assessed the anatomy and dynamic function. So most of the findings related um, specifically to anatomy that was viewed and how the structures work together from more of like a physiologic perspective Breast milk was visualized, but observing the swallow um, was difficult um, according to the researchers. So on that note, um, the study did mention that the technical and practical challenges um, make it unlikely to be suitable for swallowing assessment at present. Um, in order to eventually 
potentially in the future use MRI to evaluate breastfeeding, um, we would need quite a few advances in technology, as well as improved expertise in dynamic image capture. So if you want to flag a study to read, this one just for the pictures, I think is an amazing reference. So you can see to the left of your screen is a mid sagittal view. So you see mother's breast on the left, baby to the right. You can see um, the nipple tip there. You can see all the details of the baby's brain as well. Just absolutely fascinating. The middle picture is a coronal cross section. And the final picture to the left is an axial cross section. So you can see mom's in this picture, mom's breast is to the right. Um, the infant is to the left. You can see the mom's arm cradled around the baby and you can see the oral cavity they have labeled there right in the middle. Again, really, really cool pictures. Um, if you wanna take the time to read this study. So the final area of the latest research that we're gonna to cover today is on tongue tie. And to be honest, I was absolutely overwhelmed with the amount of available research and publications on tongue tie. So much so that it was really hard to narrow it down for purposes of this talk. The good news is that within um, this year and uh, last year, there are two very recent position papers that compiled the research and expert opinions for us. And so these position papers came from the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine and the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. So the definition according to ABM is that the tongue is limited in its range of motion and subsequent function, function being the keyword there, due to the presence of a restrictive sublingual frenulum. Both papers reported across the board a substantial increase in publications, as well as diagnosis and treatment, which I'm sure you all have felt in your units too. There just seems to be a really big buzz about tongue tie at the moment. So if you're only gonna read two papers um, from today's talk, um, both of these papers could be something good to put on your reading list. Um, I had a really hard time deciding what exactly to include from these papers because there's so much information. So what are the primary issues with tongue tie? Why are we even concerned if a baby does have a tongue tie? Well, one of the most important issues is maternal nipple discomfort and also potential for maternal nipple trauma, impeded breast milk transfer and decreased breast drainage, inadequate infant satiation, decreased weight gain, and the potential for early cessation of breastfeeding. So I do have one quote to read from this study, and it states that as these are not uncommon issues among breastfeeding dyads, it is important to note that they may be inappropriately attributed to an anatomically normal sublingual frenulum, which has been labeled as restricted. So what are the recommendations from the ABM position paper? The biggest recommendation is that tongue tie assessment must be paired with skilled breastfeeding assessment. It's not enough to just look at the structure and assume there is a tongue tie and something needs to be done. There needs to be that assessment of function. Modifications that can help with latch and position include possible use of a temporary nipple shield, and having mother express her breast milk. Um, if the baby is not able to fully empty mom's breast, um, then it's not going to cue mom's body to keep making milk as needed. So having mom express that breast milk may be necessary. This paper also highlighted and summarized the only five randomized control trials in the last 20 years about tongue tie. Again, say that one more time. In the last 20 years of research about tongue tie, only five randomized control trials were noted. So the um, synthesized results from this included that phrenotomy did decrease nipple pain, but questions remain regarding timing and outcomes when patients are treated versus not treated. And the ABM position paper clearly stated that evidence at this time is lacking with post-procedural manual manipulation. 
So our other um, position paper came from an expert panel of pediatric otolaryngologists who assessed studies from the last 20 years, and they distilled the expert opinion down to a clinical consensus. So there were 89 statements on tongue tie with a goal of trying to reach consensus on as many as they could. 41 reached consensus, 17 got close, and then 28 did not reach consensus. And so according to this paper, a lack of consensus implies that there is either a knowledge gap or lack of adequate evidence. So here are some of the more important clinical consensus statements that were reached um, relevant to our talk today. Breastfeeding difficulties are common in the newborn period and evidence shows that anterior ankyloglossia is a potential contributor to infant feeding problems. Maternal pain and poor infant latch can be caused by ankyloglossia but these symptoms can also be present with other etiologies of breastfeeding difficulties. Again, hence why skilled breastfeeding assessment is so important. Lingual phrenotomy should ideally be performed as soon as possible after the diagnosis is made in an infant with breastfeeding problems that do not improve with conservative management. Again, conservative management be, being working with a skilled lactation um, professional. It is not necessary to perform a lingual phrenotomy in an infant with little or no restriction in tongue mobility to prevent a future feeding disorder. This is a question I get from a lot of the families I work with. Um, basically, you know, is, if feeding is not an issue now, should we do a tongue tie release uh, in case there's future problems that may arise? And again, um, the consensus on that is no, that's not necessary. And then finally, a consultation with a speech pathologist is encouraged before phrenotomy in an older child who is undergoing the procedure for speech concerns. So again, if there's a concern about speech, we need an assessment from one of our um, skilled clinicians before deciding to do a surgery. So again, I encourage you to read the position papers for more detailed information. Beyond understanding these findings for your own clinical knowledge, um, it's really important to understand the perspectives of other clinicians that you may work with and who may have read these papers. So this new systematic review came out after both of the position papers, but aligns really closely with the information shared. And because as we've talked about, systematic reviews are the very best we can find, and this is from 2021, let's review um, this study, um, which was on the effects of phrenotomy on breastfeeding and speech in children with tongue tie. So what this um, study found after um, uh, critically appraising and synthesizing the research is that phrenotomy does help to reduce nipple pain as well as improve maternal self-efficacy with breastfeeding. Phrenotomy for children with speech delays is inconclusive. Um, from this study, they found a lack of objective data and lack of research quality. Many of you are probably familiar with the Bristol Tongue um, Assessment Tool. Um, it's used worldwide and translated into different languages. Um, and, but this article highlights a simple picture version of the Bristol to aid and enhance consistent assessments of infant with tongue tie. So it's a visual um, application of the Bristol. And it's called the TABI or the TABI, not totally sure, but you can see it's an acronym there from the title. So the pros about this is that it's quick and very easy to use and provides a really clear visual scale to assess the tongue structure. There's a high innovator reliability. The cons, it cannot be used alone to determine the need for a phrenotomy. Um, you hear this theme come up again and again throughout the position papers and the studies on tongue tie is that we really need um, that feeding assessment. Um, and this tool doesn't include that. It also doesn't include maternal autonomy and it does not have an interview with a breastfeeding mother. So let's take a look at the tool. So again, it's a visual representation of the Bristol. And basically there's four things that are being assessed. The score is a zero to a one with zero being the most restrictive and two meaning the tongue has the most mobility and is not restricted. What does the tongue tip look like? 
Where is it fixed to the gum? How high can it lift wide, lift, um, lift in the mouth when the mouth is wide open? And how far can the tongue stick out? So the takeaway from this study, um, the TABI is a tool um, that can be used in this really simple, reliable way to assess tongue tie and assure everyone is on the same page when discussing the anatomic structures. So this is our final study of the talk. Um, and it's a really interesting case study, which you've probably noticed I have mainly steered away from in this talk. So when you think back to our pyramid of strength of studies, um, this would be um, a level five, um, because it's a single case study, which means it may be hard to extrapolate results to the general population. But I think it's still a really interesting case and it could fit um, the specific needs of a patient you have. Um, so this was a case study of a former 37-week infant who had RSV, pneumonia, was intubated eight days. The patient had an abnormal fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing and discharged home on NG feeds with a really small, um, limited token oral feeding practice. Four weeks later, a video fluoroscopic swallow study was completed, and the patient also had, over the months to come, three subsequent video fluoroscopic swallow studies. They all showed impaired base of tongue movement, nasopharyngeal regurgitation, impaired pharyngeal constriction, and it all um, resulted in inefficient bolus, clearing, bolus clearance excuse me, um, and aspiration. So safety concerns were noted as well. The study has a lot of great pictures. This is just a couple for you to reference. Um, you can see there's evidence of residuals, um, poor bolus containment, mesopharyngeal reflux, and penetration, as well as aspiration. So the hypothesis was that the poor base of tongue movement was related to anatomy and causing these problems. So the um, child, was a child at this point, 17 months old, was found to have a posterior tongue tie and also had an associated um, difficulty with articulation. So around 17 months of age, this was repaired and a video fluoroscopic swallow study was repeated two months post-op. And what they found was that the child had significant improvement in swallowing function, improved base of tongue movement, resulting in decreased residuals and complete resolution of the aspiration. So here are pictures of the um, post-op um, video fluoroscopic swallow study, and you can see there really was a great improvement in swallowing function. So improved bolus containment, no aspirational penetrations, no um, pharyngeal reflux. So I found this to be a really interesting and um, positive success story, if you will, to end our research update on. So additional recommendations as we wrap up today's talk. Um, I can't express it enough, but the onus is on us as clinicians to stay current on the latest research. Although today's um, talk included studies from the last three to five years, new information is coming out all the time. And in just a couple years, this talk potentially will be a little bit outdated as well. So that means we need to keep up with ongoing literature reviews can be helpful to um, collaborate with others to stay on top of things. And that would include discussions via journal clubs. There's several out there available online. Um, you could also start or join one at your place of employment. Perhaps it's having just a little research um, update or one study shared at each staff meeting so that you can stay updated on the latest research and keep your colleagues on top of things as well. If you're an auditory learner like I am, there are some um, research-based podcasts. Um, Breastfeeding Medicine podcast is a really amazing one. Um, they just talk about latest studies that have come out and um, it's a really great way to let someone else do the work for you and stay on top of the research. And again, um, you know, when you have the opportunity to take continuing education courses, you can prioritize those um, that uh, support breastfeeding. Something else that is, I think, really important is to make sure that you have evidence-based references. Um, LactMed um, used to have an application for phones. I heard that's no longer being updated, but you can still access all of the information about um, their recommendation for breastfeeding on different medications on the NCBI bookshelf. 
And then also make sure you have a good solid reference book to utilize. Um, no one can be responsible for holding all of the research by memory on your own. So in returning to the concepts of this study before we close, um, today's lecture again covered the first three bullet points. Now it's time to leave you um, with the rest of the work. So I love number four and pulled it in as a direct quote from the paper, but what it says we must do is implement best practices by blending external evidence with clinical expertise and patient preferences and values. How beautiful is that? Um, it's really the art and science of medicine, which I frequently tell my families when there's not a clear cut answer or the perfect way to do things. We have to take the evidence as best as we can, apply it to the situation and provide that ongoing evaluation to see if it's making a difference or not. And then after best practices are implemented, we need to evaluate how the implementation went. And then finally, we need to share the findings, good and bad, with the healthcare community. So I share this quote not to discourage you, but to truly and hopefully inspire you and remind you what hard work it can be to update and change practices. It states that on average, it takes 17 years to get clinical research into daily practice and less than 50% of clinical research makes it to general use. So knowing that, I wanna leave you with some action items from the talk today. Um, you've already done the most time intensive part, which was sitting through the lecture. And um, so before you close your computer, race back to see your patients, um, I wanna encourage you to just take a few moments to list three specific things from the talk today that you want to integrate into your practice to further support infants and breastfeeding mothers. Choose at least three, maybe just even one or two articles to read on your own. Sign up for a breastfeeding specific CEU course. And finally, solidify at least one idea for a quality improvement or research study at your institution. So a QI study can be a really great way to start out. It's usually much less daunting um, to examine our own practices and it may be um, expedited process to get IRB approval if it's even needed versus a full-blown research study where it is required. Here are the references for your review. Again, nothing older than 2016, most are 2018 or newer. And I just really wanna say thank you so much for sticking with me on the journey of the talk today. I truly hope um, you've gained something new from the literature discussed and have your action items ready to integrate the information at your institution and within your clinical practice. Thank you again. Thanks so much, Kelly. I really appreciate you doing all the work you did also on all the research and trying to get all the evidence-based practice for our audience. So thank you. And we have time for a few questions. Um, let's see. So how about, um, what is your recommended length of your window for the protected breastfeeding window? Yeah, that's a really good question, Lisa. Um, so, you know, in looking at the literature, there's not um, something that uh, has been really clear cut research in terms of how long the period of protected breastfeeding should be. And so what I would recommend is look at your unit, see what is realistic for families so that they can really take advantage of um, the protected breastfeeding without putting too much pressure on families as well. 
Um, the other thing to think about is how can we encourage babies to go have more at breast experience before they're even ready for bottle feeding, right? So if mom has pumped and the baby's held skin to skin, could they start licking, nuzzling, being at the breast at a younger gestational age or um, postmenstrual age? So I think that there are ways to promote um, breast at breast experiences before the bottle. Um, most I've worked in a few different NICUs over the years and I've seen protected breastfeeding in the range from like a week to 24 hours. But again, I think it depends on your unit and the availability of families to be present for that. Thank you. If you notice a tongue tie in a preemie, when do you recommend it being addressed? So um, it's always going to come down to what the function is. So it's not just the structure, but it's also that functional assessment. And so I do think it's fair to let the um, baby have a chance to try to feed. Um, and then if at all possible, obviously the tongue tie would need to be looked at by a medical professional as well, whether it's your um, pediatricians, your neonatologists, your otolaryngologist, like whoever it is at your facility who does that assessment as well. Um, but it's really that uh, structure assessment and then the functional assessment of feeding that would kind of determine when that needs to be addressed. Great, thank you. And then um, one more question that I can see here is how, especially as therapists, what would you recommend in a first step to becoming an IBCLC? Yeah, that is that is a, a favorite question for people to uh, uh, to ask. Um, there's three different pathways. If you go to the IBCLC website um, that you can take um, to be able to um, get and it's a combination of like your training in school, um, your continuing education that you receive, and then also your experience with patients. So most people who are a therapist and maybe already working with babies, already working on feeding, probably can do like um, a different pathway than someone who's like just starting out and doesn't have that experience. Um, I did pathway one, I believe it was, um, that was a combination of my clinical hours, continuing education, and um, also my training from being an occupational therapist. So there's a couple different options and the IBCLC website has tons of information on that. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna do go one more cause it came in late. Um, uh, which bottle nipple mimics the same as breastfeeding? That is a loaded question. I know. <laughs> Sorry, you were telling us that. That is a loaded question. Um, a lot of bottles will claim to mimic breastfeeding, um, but the way bottles and uh, breastfeeding work are very different, especially as um, you saw on the study that talks about video fluoroscopic swallow studies and um, the actual structures and um, how they function when they're feeding between the both. Um, you know, more important than the shape might actually be to consider the flow. Um, and so one thing we don't want to happen is babies get used to too fast of a flow from the bottle, which makes it a little bit more difficult to transition back and forth between the breast and the bottle. Um, so yeah, even more important than the shape and, and people have tons of opinions on this. There's not good research um, out there. This is a research-based uh, talk. It's not good research that says yeah. which bottle is best, but I would um, really think about the flow rate and making sure baby is not getting a fast faster flow from the bottle than from their mom. Great, thank you. Um, so if you had a question that was asked but not answered, again, we will put these on our website. There will be handouts, all the references, all the questions answered when the webinar is posted in a few weeks. Um, and that is actually the end of this part of the presentation. But before we end, I just have two additional pieces of information for you. Um, you just heard Kelly talk all about how important beginning breastfeeding is in the NICU. So we would like you to know that our infant driven feeding program is a wonderful asset for your team to improve breastfeeding rates in the NICU. So IDF, if you haven't heard about it, is an online training program that your hospital can purchase for all staff to complete. And hospitals have actually reported that there are huge breastfeeding benefits after they implement unit-wide IDF. So some of these examples are that it encourages a protected breastfeeding window, which we've talked a lot about. Um, it encourages, again, as one of the things Kelly talked about was the first oral, oral feeding at the breast. It promotes kangaroo care, which we know um, is shown to increase breastfeeding rates. It dispels common NICU myths, such as, oh, your baby has to take a bottle before they can breastfeed. So we get rid of those myths. It supports parents in the breastfeeding journey supports positive feeding experiences from the start, 
and definitely establishes consistency surrounding breastfeeding because we've seen that there is so much inconsistency. So IDF helps to establish that consistency. And if you have any questions about uh, the infant-driven feeding program, please feel free to reach out to us at medinfo at drbrownsmedical.com. And then one more thing we'd really like to announce is that Dr. Brown's Medical is very excited to announce an exciting addition to the Infant Driven Feeding Program for next year. By collaborating with Kelly, it will include an updating breastfeeding section to the current program. This section will add more depth, describing specifically how to use IDF with your breastfeeding family. So we can't wait for that. Thank you all for being here. And as we just wrap up, our next webinar will be in November and more to come on that. So stay tuned. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Bye, thank you.